good. Probably not. Yikes. You bet. Okay. We don't need any more of these. Hello and Happy New Year, everybody. Uh, welcome to the first NSF Live of 2022. We're going to recap 2021. A lot of exciting stuff happened and then uh, talk about what we can expect in 2022. I am Stephen Marr. I'm one of the photographers here at NASA Space Flight, and I am being joined today by Assistant Managing Editor, Chris Gebhardt. How are you doing, Chris? I am doing quite well, and I'm sure a lot of people know why I'm here today. <laughs> <laughs> and also one of our writers and also a voice you'll hear on a lot of these weekly uh, Starship recaps, we have Ian Atkinson. How are you doing, Ian? Doing great, Stephen. Glad to be here. Very exciting year and very exciting year to look forward to as well. Yeah, uh, and yeah, we're gonna get into predictions and what we, what we expect to see fly uh, this coming year. Uh, but we're gonna start off with, I think, possibly the most important mission of the year, or perhaps uh, some some would argue the last twenty five years. Oh, by the way, before we get into it, I just want to remind everybody: if you have any questions, put them in chat at NASA Space Flight, uh, included in the comments somewhere, and we will be able to see that and try to get to as many questions as we can. Uh, but yeah, let's talk about the most important mission this year, arguably. That would yeah. be James Webb Space Telescope. <laughs> Chris, do you have any insight? Have you? Have, did you happen to see any news about this thing? This weird golden shaped thing? Or, or I golden mean, I, 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 I slept to it. No. Um. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no. Uh, I mean, this this is incredible for 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 so many uh, different reasons. And um, ah, and you can see the offending plume we're going to get to this you can see mm. the little offending plume that ruined the remote camera shot uh, um, <laughs> uh of this but uh no um nasa space flight was one of the very few media organizations in the world all told about 20 that got access for this mission mm -hmm. uh, and that was uh, spread out across the united states canada and the the european union uh so uh, very, very incredible to have the type of access that we did. Uh, and you can see the mixture of both the official live uh, NASA feed that we had of the liftoff, as well as the uh, video that I was shooting from the balcony of the Jupiter Control Center. And that's me. Uh, you are. <laughs> <laughs> one of the very few moments we have ever shown a face on an NSF live stream of a liftoff. Um, but we thought that was very important to do, uh, just given where we were and 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 how we were able to be there. And of course, that is a, a real scale mock up of the Ariane 5 behind me in, in that uh, image. And I am basically standing exactly where we uh, shot the launch from and where I witnessed the liftoff from, which is about uh, 12 kilometers away from the launch pad on the Jupiter Control Center. Um, a terrace. So basically, at liftoff, it, when you see everyone on Ariane Spa's webcasts run out onto the balconies from just behind the control center, I was one balcony up above them. So they all came running out below me, and they got to hear me scream, "Oh my God!" when it lifted <laughs> off, and it was much louder than that at liftoff, as the stream can attest. Um, yeah, yeah. I thought it was it was crazy, and I, it's probably normal, but um, I was uh, noticing that the people inside that were kind of in the I don't know, you call them bleachers that are around like the control room. Mm -hmm. They didn't run out until like a minute and a half to go. I was worried that mm -hmm. they wouldn't all get outside in time, you know, because they all <laughs> got to funnel through the doors. <laughs> so, so thankfully, there are many doors, uh, like okay. a concert stadium, uh, uh -huh. <laughs> to funnel you in. Uh, but yeah, you know, the the view, and and we'll get to it at some point here in in, in the video that we've got of, of the live stream. You know. You can, it's a very different view. And, and that's one of the things that going to different launch sites and experiencing the different terrains that the vehicles launch from is really part of the experience. So, mm -hmm. you know, in Florida, we're used to, and, and, and Baikonur, right? We're, and Wallops, we're used to this very flat terrain where you can see pad after pad after pad after pad, right? At, at Vandenberg, we're used to, well, the pad's over there if the fog cooperates, you right. know? Um, uh, you know, but part of the 
part of the mystique, right, of the Guiana Space Center is that it launches from the Amazon rainforest. And, yeah. and we are firmly in the Amazon rainforest for this. And it will remind you of that every day with how much it rains. Uh, yeah. Um, and wasn't uh, there a warning of, of leopards or... Uh, yeah, yeah, Was yeah, it yeah. They're, yeah. Yeah, they're reintroducing um, like jaguars. They're reintroducing jaguars, jaguars right, right, right. Uh, into into the local population there. Uh, and one had been spotted just outside of the pad perimeter called the Round Road um, mm -hmm. for the Ariane Five and Vega uh, complex uh, there uh, when, when we were there. So yeah, uh, wildlife preserve just like uh, just like we always talk about Kennedy being. But but the reason they don't run outside um, any earlier than that is because you can only barely see like the very tippity top of the payload fairing of the Ariane 5 oh, okay. and the top of the lightning towers. Uh, so you can't really see the vehicle when it's on the pad there because it literally rises out of the jungle yeah. <laughs> as it ascends. Uh, so, I mean, it was incredible to be there for it. And, and of course, you know, I, I was on my little phone watching the just shy of live images come back of payload fairing separation and the the separation of the of the web telescope itself yeah that was a huge surprise first we got the the cg version of it and yes. then all of a sudden they bring up actual views it, you know it was like i don't know five or ten seconds after actual or you know i'm not sure exactly but yeah it was it was oh and here they are and right they, now and they had people reviewing that in the control room making the decision you know on the fly you know was everything okay to show um and and oh. then they ended up going with it uh and man i think we all around the world had that little moment of oh my gosh it's That's waving it. goodbye yes. when the solar panel popped out uh right. and everything that was really unexpected but um you know i'm sure there are a lot of questions and we've got other things to show um you know uh, another video and assets to show here um and to talk about with, with uh, uh the trip to french guiana and everything and, and launch with james webb but uh, the, I, before we just moved on, I wanted to say it was a huge thank you to, to Ariane Spas, who really was the one who put all of this together for the media uh, and everything. It was it was an absolute incredible uh, journey to, to work with them, and hopefully not the last time uh, we do, uh, given some more things that they've got coming up um, here. But uh, really, really, uh, my 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 thanks to them for, for putting on a, a wonderful program for us and always having something for us to do, uh, even with delays. Um, oh, really? Which we knew, uh, you know, and, and yeah. you know, you know, you're going to encounter delays. So they, they always had things for us uh, in the event that it, it had slipped further than the 25th. Yeah. Wow. Like. Yeah. Uh, there would have been a jungle hike one day. Uh, probably wow. we would have gotten out to the Soyuz pad uh, one day as well. Uh, Vega was a little tricky because it's partly there and it's solid rocket. So like it's uh, a bit like more yeah. um, uh, constrained um, right. in that regard. Um, but one of the launch delays actually allowed us to go to the Ariane 6 facilities, which we'll talk about uh, coming up. But uh, ah, this was one that got me. Um, yeah. <laughs> when they said, oh yeah, and then you get to go see it before it rolls out. Like, I didn't think they met, I mean, like, I'm literally 30 feet from that. Like, right. Yeah, that, yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. This is very, yeah, this is a, this is a wide angle. And, uh, yeah, if you know anything yeah. about wide angle, it, 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 it makes distances look further actually. And, and you're, yeah. yeah, you're much closer than it seems. Yeah. Yeah. That is awesome. Yeah. I mean, they brought us right up to it. Uh, I mean, we don't ever get that close here at the cave Ooh, like it not, no. you know, uh, never, not that close <laughs> no uh not without having to sign a lot of paperwork yeah. uh yeah. <laughs> uh no so i mean i mean like yeah it, it was it was sort of you know each day was structured uh, sort of around what the vehicle was doing where we were in the count and when it was safe to go different places so you know when because of how it worked the day that we got there was the day that they ended up delaying from the 24th to the 25th so we had this awkward extra l minus three day um in there because they were simply moving the rollout and everything one day at a time uh because that's part of their sequencing is to really only try to have the area and five out there for um uh for for two days on the pad before your opening liftoff attempt okay so you know they were moving that and that got us to see the Ariane six facilities and then the next day was rollout and man when i said rollout in the jungle in my tweet i really meant it because like you have this shot right here 
which was basically the only moment it wasn't a torrential tropical downpour. Um, uh, and but yeah, so basically it involved standing out there in a raincoat with the uh, camera also having a raincoat on it, but also holding an umbrella so that the lens would not get wet Water, yeah. uh, as as <laughs> I tried to film the Ariane 5 going between the bu uh, the bushes uh, in the gaps in the jungle yeah, but... <laughs> uh, and everything as she went out to the launch pad. <laughs> um so yeah uh it, it it's definitely you definitely get the full experience of being down there uh if you stay outside for more than 15 minutes uh, i would yeah. say you're gonna get a rain shower oh man yeah. and how about the mosquitoes i have to ask <laughs> Uh, so the one thing that they absolutely warn you about uh, both before leaving the U.S. to go there and when you arrive is bug spray uh, right. and mosquito repellent with very specific, right. like very specific, you know, make sure it has this in it. Um, and so as a result, the mosquitoes weren't too, too bad. Um, okay. But man, I will tell you this, a, a born and raised Florida boy and that humidity gave me a run for my money. Really? Ooh, yeah uh yeah i mean y you know Stephen, how d during a florida summer there's nothing quite like m moving into the air conditioning oh yeah but you don't normally have an audible like oh reaction to doing <laughs> so <laughs> uh which is what it was like for me uh uh down there um but you know they also had a really nice um they also had a really nice Christmas Eve dinner for us because there oh. were all of us who were there, you know, who'd given up our holidays to be there, including the, like the higher ups at Ion Spas and, and NASA, like Thomas Zerbukin and Stefan Israel and all the, you know, program managers and science, program scientists for web and the media members. It was all just a nice little, you know, traditional, what we were told was basically a traditional French Christmas Eve dinner in French Guiana. Uh, Yes. I mean, I, I, I feel like we need to get into space flight stuff, but I'm so <laughs> interested about this. Like, like what, what, what's the traditional yeah. meal? Like, what, did they have turkey, ham? What was it? Um, oh, it was duck. Oh, duck. Okay, duck. cool. Yes. All right. Well, look, we, we, we can't uh, tarry here too long because I know that uh, chat yeah. wants to probably hear <laughs> us talk about actual space things. Well, uh, that too. And I'm sure they've got questions about this themselves. So they, yeah. they <laughs> do. Um, and, and I have, I have one chambered, but uh, give yeah. us uh, sort of a, a rundown of where, where do we stand right now with James Webb uh, on its way to Lagrange point two? Yeah, so you can see the sort of live update right here uh, for the distance of where it currently is. In terms of its deployment sequence, uh, the update that we got just shortly before we came on air is that the additional tensioning that they were talking about that was initially yesterday, but they delayed it to today to give the team some time off is now going to be tomorrow at the earliest. They're really taking a lot of time here to get to understand exactly how the observatory is behaving as it goes through the deployment sequence. And a very important part of the deployment sequence is that each one of those things, each one of those moments can be paused, right? So it's not like right. you do one thing and now you've got 15 minutes and then the next thing is going to automatically trigger like you would have in, say, a rocket's automated countdown sequence. Mm -hmm. Right, where stopping it means bringing the whole shebang to a to a close, and that's not the case with Web. Right, we we can pause, especially at these very key points, and sort of do what they're saying and let the telescope talk to them. They can get a sense for how it's behaving as it's cooling down, verify that it's behaving as they thought it would during the pre during the pre-launch and Earth-based deployment sequences that they took the sun shield through. One of the very good things is they practiced all of this and they got to practice the whole deployment sequence of the sun shield uh, okay. on the ground. So the sun shield deployment is not one of those, oh gosh, they weren't able to test it um, mm -hmm. before we lifted off things. So uh, was but there it, anything it is, off but top of your is, head? Yes, the cryo cooler. Well, Okay. Uh, the very critical cryo cooler. They could test each of uh, the, the two components, but because one of the components is on the deployable boom mm -hmm. and the other is on the spacecraft bus, so to speak, they were not able to test that completely. Uh, sure. But the sun shield, they were. So, you know, they're stopping, they're pausing, they're taking some more time. Ultimately, I think we can all agree if it takes them 54 days and every single deployment thing works, 
fantastic. It took yeah, you 54 days. Yeah. I'm not yeah. counting. You got There's it no all rush. deployed. <laughs> exactly. There's no Take rush your time. Out. Yeah. Take exactly. Your time. And you can sort of see them doing this. And another very important thing, you know, we talk about the complexity of web's deployment a lot before mm -hmm. it lifted off. It's also worth noting that this is also the first time we've done something like this, where we have deployed a telescope in this fashion. Forget the complexity of deploying it. It's the first time we've deployed a telescope like this, where it had to do all of these incredible folds to get into the payload fairing. So I, don't expect it to take 30 days. <laughs> expect it to take longer. Um, sure. But things do seem to be going very well. Um, but of course, it is uh, you know, worth mentioning that the sun shield is where the vast majority, like 87% of the single point failures reside. Um, okay. So this is this is the moment to really hold your breath. Um, right. So this is the moment you would really want to see them taking a moment. Um, right, and so we've got the we've got those mid boom arms extended, right? And so it has. In fact, I think the the tweet that NASA put out was you know, shine bright like a diamond. So yeah, it looks yes. like that. It's not quite. <laughs> Like it, it's it doesn't have tension yet, but it does have that diamond shape now, and that's that's like a, a big milestone, right? It it, it is it, it it really is, um, you know, because you know it's it's not just deploying it and getting it tensioned. It's then all the layers that have to start popping up individually for it because. The sun shield is the thing that not only helps um, keep the optics clear of scattered light, that's one of the things that the sun shield does, um, mm -hmm. but it, its primary purpose is to passively cool the array down to between 30 and 50 degrees Kelvin so that the cryo cooler can then take over and cool it down to six Kelvin. Right. Uh, and zero Kelvin is absolute zero. So uh, we're talking very, very cool <laughs> is yeah. where we're headed. Um, so, so yeah, you know, like th this is one of those critical moments of getting the tension on them because that's a huge thing that's needed for the next step and for yeah. the overall functionality of the array. All right. Let's, let's hit a, a question here. I've got one, I think, oh, I've got, I think I've got a couple that, uh, relate to, uh, JWST. Uh, Tony says, uh, if JWST is a full success and went a hundred percent, do you think Lavor, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, would be possibly funded. Out of the four observatories, which would you like funded? Love you all. Hey, Ian, you want to go first? <laughs> yeah, and this actually came to my mind when you're talking about um, the deployment of James Webb. So like you said, nothing like this has been done before, but a lot of the proposed telescopes, notably Louvoir, build on the technology of James Webb. Louvoir, much like James Webb, uh, in either of its two configurations, would have a folding mirror. So James Webb needs to demonstrate that this is possible to get Louvoir funded. Um, now, we did see the Decadal Survey, which is basically a big congregation of astronomers, astrophysicists, um, scientists, basically getting together to say, what do we want to do this next decade? What do we want to fund and get started and launch? And they um, believe that NASA's next step after um, the Roman telescope would be to build a about six meter UV optical infrared telescope. And Louvoir is a uh, nine to 15 meter UV optic infrared telescope. So it seems like Louvoir or a Louvoir derivative may be the next um, major space telescope. But again, that was a very arbitrary number. They said around six meter meter diameter that could be larger, could be smaller, um, that could be not even funded in general. So we're gonna have to watch over the next few years, see what NASA invests in, see what NASA chooses. And from there, we can start to determine what is after James Webb. Yeah, I mean, I think I think to the the second part of your question, um, which one which one do I pref which one would I want to see funding? Well, all, and, and and I say that with my you know astrophysicist and astrophysics heart uh, on my sleeve there, uh, all of them. Uh, Louvoir would, would would definitely be huge in in, in that particular range um, in, in that particular wavelength, but. <sighs> You know, I think I think one of the main stopping points for Louvoir and for the types of telescopes that we have been talking about for for a long time has been the sheer size. Like you were saying um, there, Ian, you know, the, the diameter of the Louvoir mirror being between 9 and 12 meters in diameter. Well, even with the big shiny thing under development down in Texas, it would still have to fold up to fit inside <laughs> Starship. Um, and, and holy moly, yep. Starship's massive. Uh, <laughs> you know, you've all seen it. Uh, <laughs> 
Um, you know, so 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 we're still we're still talking about like even though the size of our of our potential launch vehicles for these things, even though they are getting larger in diameter and in larger in terms of the mass that they can take to low Earth orbit or beyond with refueling, we're still in this weird phase where you still need the telescopes in some ways to be bigger, to observe in the detail that we need them to be able to see in the wavelengths and how far back they're able mm -hmm. to see. Um, just like we just saw with Webb having to fold up, you know, 340 some odd times just to fit inside the Ariane 5 payload fairing. And that payload fairing is huge, you know, compared <laughs> to the other vehicles that, that we have on the market at, at five meters in diameter and 16 meters in length. So, you know, I, I think that's a huge element to what comes next now if starship does prove itself and prove it and prove itself to be a thing that can have the finesse as well to handle these really intensive nasa science missions and flagship science missions like luvar would be i think we'd be there you know mm -hmm. in, in having a vehicle capable of of lifting of lifting these things and and having that as well as having you know the price tag the proposed price tag of a starship would be huge for launching something like this um, I mean, considering that, you know, the Louvoir mirror is just eyeballing it about four times the size of the James Webb <laughs> uh, mirror, <laughs> which which was itself about four times the size of the Hubble mirror. So you you can see how we're scaling here as we, yeah. go, as we go out into the future. Uh, all right. Well, let me see. Uh, we, we had Cape Town Knights over here asking uh, Chris G directly. Uh, Chris G. What were your feelings when you saw the rocket that close? I mean, it has to be many, many years in the making to get to that spot, and there you were. Uh, yeah. Um, well, even when I was down there, as I said earlier, I didn't think I would be that close to Ariane uh, 5, um, both when, when uh, she was still in the assembly uh, the, the final assembly building uh, mm -hmm. uh, and when she was out at the launch pad. Um, the, the photos I showed were not as close as we got to her on the launch pad um we actually got closer um uh, they, they very conveniently did not tell us that uh so we yeah. did not have cameras at the ready uh, um, yeah. when we drove by um but uh no we we, we did get closer uh it, it it was incredible you know like, like everything the vehicles all sound very different the launch pads sound very different one thing i wasn't expecting at the ariane 5 pad was what very much sounded like gunfire at first, mm -hmm. a v very loud percussive pops, which I at first assumed to be like an animal system, like like keep the animals away, right? Because the the French Legion and and the French military are there patrolling the forest, patrolling the perimeters prior to the liftoff, um, just like our military and security patrol, you know, the Cape and Vandenberg right. and, and things like that. So I, I thought it was something like that. And, and then they said, no, that's how we burn off the hydrogen. When the liquid hydrogen is, is burning off uh -huh. in, its, in, in the holding tanks and everything there, they percussively, you know, vaporize it as, a, as, as part of their system for how they, uh, how they pacify it uh, cool. after it turns to gas. So that's what we were hearing. Was oh. um, was basically the hydrogen burnoff system uh, for the Ariane Five. So uh, that was pretty cool. Um, yeah, I and, didn't and, know and that something was a thing. that you would only have gotten being that close to the pad and and being that close to the vehicle. Um, let's see, Keith Keith Tay wanted to know: Does JWST use Tedris or Deep Space Network or other? Uh, it uses the ground, actually. Um, so it uses a series of ground tracking stations. So if you uh, were watching the launch, and I don't know, maybe, Michael, we can find this part of the liftoff sequence where Ariane 5 is tracking across the Atlantic, you can see the series of different tracking stations. Uh, Nadal, Ascension are in the Atlantic. And then you have uh, Malindi off the coast of Kenya in the Indian Ocean. And you can see the various tracking stations that she's communicating with uh, on the ground. Mm -hmm. And if you think back, and I'll only mention this now since uh, the launch was a success for James Webb. If you think back a few missions, uh, a few years ago, back to 2017, I believe it was. Yeah, you can see the ground tracking stations there in the center um, uh, in, in, in the third image from the left there as Ariane is tracking across the Atlantic there, uh, mm -hmm. right to the uh, right of the weird mascot thing that has just uh, appeared on the, on the <laughs> 
screen again, which I think we commented on during the broadcast as well. But those are the ground tracking stations that she communicates with during ascent. And if you think back to 2017, when they accidentally put in a six degree orbital inclination instead of a three degree orbital inclination and Ariane wandered off into the mm -hmm. wrong inclination right. and we lost communication with her because the ground tracking stations were not aimed for a six degree inclination so she just went out of range of the ground tracking stations but kept going and kept firing and kept doing everything and then eventually when the satellites came back around that's when they called home and we were like well we're here we're just not in the orbit we thought we would be in and that's why we lost communication with the vehicle mm -hmm. um, because it doesn't communicate upward to tjus like the u.s rocket like some u.s rockets do right all right, and Nick, keep them coming, y'all. Make sure you remember to hit that at NASA Space Flight, and uh, we'll try to get your question answered here. Uh, Nick wanting to know, how long will it take until we get pictures from JWST? I think that's the question everybody wants to know. Yes, it is. Uh, yeah, so uh, a great question to follow up the where are we now. Um, it will be a while. It will be at least until the middle of this year, um, July, August-ish, if everything in the unfold process and the commissioning phase, because uh, remember, it's not just the planned 30-ish day commissioning phase which, or, or an unfolding phase, which will be a little longer now because we know they're taking a, a bit of extra time here. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also the commissioning phase and it will take the cryo cooler, you know, five months to cool this thing down so that the Miri primary optic sensor that sees in the infrared will be able to see and, and get those first images and you have to calibrate it. So it'll be probably July or August before we would get those first light images released by NASA if everything goes to plan. Um, of course, if, if the commissioning takes a bit longer, if the deployment takes a bit longer, but we get there in the end, could, could, be, could be longer. But this is where the very accurate insertion of the Ariane 5 comes in really handy because it gave them a lot of extra propellant to utilize right. for an actual operational mission. Yeah. Um, and that's very much worth mentioning before we, uh, before we move on because right, as yeah. much as we could just talk about <laughs> web the entire day, um, uh, Webb was not the only thing that happened in 2021, and Ian needs to talk at some point on this broadcast. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Thank well, you. Uh, yeah, uh, another very exciting thing that happened, and, and actually, uh, it was my first time being on an NSF stream, was when uh, Perseverance landed, of course, with uh, Ingenuity on board. Um, so how is that mission going? Yeah, so Perseverance is going great. Um, we saw it touch down in February. Um, it touched it down in the Jazera the J sorry, Jezera Crater, which is an ancient river delta. So back when Mars had water billions of years ago, um, this uh, area that Perseverance landed in was a river delta, basically where a river ended and moved into a large lake. Uh, they think that this area out of anywhere on Mars may have a high chance of having life if Mars ever had life. Um, so the main point of the Perseverance mission is to find signs of ancient life um, and better understand the history of Mars. Um, but Perseverance was not a single spacecraft. Uh, it actually brought along a little passenger, Ingenuity, which is a little drone. It's about the size, about the size like a cereal box or so, like a, like a small suitcase. Um, and Ingenuity uh, is a little small drone with two propellers on top, and it was to demonstrate and gather data on what it's like to fly on another world. Um, as of uh, earlier this year, there had never been a flight of a winged or uh, propeller vehicle off of Earth, but that changed when Ingenuity took off. Um, as of now, it has completed over 15 flights, um, and it's just keep chugging along. Um, it was originally supposed to just do five flights, but NASA loved it so much, and it's brought back so much useful data. It's actually part of the science mission now, um, and they're using it to uh, determine areas that it's tough or would take a while for Perseverance to go to and figure out, oh, is this area of any scientific use, or is this actually safe to drive this way, um, which is a major benefit. It increases the safety and the science return of the rover mission. Um, and, and I want to highlight one specific thing that you just said, because that's yeah. sort of the abstract, and it's already done that, because the if you remember back when Perseverance went to do its first sample collection as part of the sample return portion of its mission, and they looked in the tube after they collected the sample and they're like, there's nothing here. What happened to it? Like, um, and they realized they needed to go elsewhere. It was aerial images taken from Ingenuity that aimed them at the new location where they were then actually able to just move the rover over there. So Ingenuity really proven itself already. <laughs> 
Yeah, exactly. And the little thing just keeps going and there's no sign that it's going to be stopping anytime soon. So yeah, did you, I'm sorry, good. I had a, I had a weird glitch going yeah. on over here, but did, did you already say how far it's flown? Uh, we have not yet, uh, but it it's has like, flown yeah, like 3.6 kilometers, I believe so far it's flown. So impressive. And, and I know like before they, uh, b before they actually started testing out ingenuity, it, it was a lot of, you know, this is just a demonstration test and, you know, don't expect too much. It, it, but uh, what it turned out doing is actually assisting with the primary mission, right? Like it's actually done a little bit of scouting already, right? Yeah, absolutely. And that's its main purpose now is to be a scout for perseverance and to figure out, hey, this area over here looks neat. Let's check it out from the air and see what it's like. Let's go there with about a minute of travel time instead of days or weeks or months of travel time or yeah. saying this area looks neat. We think we can go this way, but we're a little concerned. They can see it from the air and realize this is a dangerous obstacle or this way over here looks much safer and much faster. And they've already had a situation where they determined a path and they took ingenuity up looked around a little bit and said okay that looks a little dangerous we're going to take this easier path around that and it's going to dramatically increase the scientific return and the safety and longevity of perseverance because uh, i'm going to end my tangent here but we saw the spirit rover um which was uh landed in i believe it was like 2004 or so mm -hmm. it got stuck in the sand and it was unable to keep moving and eventually it died because of the angle the solar panels were at and dust collection. So even though Perseverance is powered by plutonium, if it got stuck, that would suck. Mm -hmm. So just being able to make it safer, determine safer and faster paths, great benefits overall. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and the one thing I'll, I'll add in there, a huge benefits because this has worked, the more and more flights they can get out of this rotocraft, this rotorcraft flying around Mars, the more data they have for the much larger, like curiosity sized helicopter mobile flying thing called Dragonfly yes. that they're going to send to Titan the moon yes. of Saturn here at the end of the decade, which basically is, is a perseverance style machine, but instead of roving around Titan it will have four you know it will have the quadcopters in everything and yep. it will fly itself from science location to science location and this is our reaction to Tango Delta nominal uh, 11 <laughs> months ago when she touched down uh, <laughs> yeah. the, the wait for it wait for it <laughs> and, and I I had like gotten excited a little too early because we had done this a few years ago with, well, almost 10 years, I guess nine years ago now with, uh, with Curiosity. So, you know, the first time I ever heard Tango Delta Nominal was with the Curiosity stream. And so then whenever I heard that this time, I was, I was ready to jump up and down, but everybody else was kind of reserved. And then finally they said touchdown confirmed because I guess there was one other thing they had to check, but it, it was, it was so intense and exciting. I think that's the thing that I'm, you know, I, I love James Webb Space Telescope, but I think that was the thing that really got me going uh, this year. There was a lot, to be fair. Yeah, <laughs> yeah this, this year, 2021 has been a big year for scientific exploration. And to bounce off of that, not only did we see Perseverance, we saw two other Mars missions arrive at Mars successfully. Mm -hmm. uh, we saw the al Amal probe from the UAE, right. um, the first time they've ever sent a probe to Mars. We also saw the Chinese Tianwen-1 mission, which is a combined orbiter and uh, lander and rover mission. Right. Very successful overall, which is unheard of to have a first attempt at a Mars landing be successful. Mm -hmm. um, we can see a picture there of the rover not, and the Not lander. to mention that epic flex that it did <laughs> by dropping the camera and then reversing yeah. to take a selfie of itself on oh, its yeah. landing platform. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this mission is all about deployable cameras. The rover's deployed cameras. The orbiter has deployed cameras. Uh, we saw a few days ago and the orbiter, the Tianwen-1 orbiter, deployed a camera to look at itself, at itself looking yeah. at Mars. Mm -hmm. And it's just crazy to see that. Like, look at this. This that looks like a render. Like that. Yeah, I know. Yeah, there's the picture there. It's right, unbelievable. Yeah. yeah, this is something you just don't get because, well, they don't typically deploy a camera just to look at the you know at itself. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, and, and, and you cool. know, like we the, the 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 beauty of this is like we keep being surprised at, at these selfies that 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 the mission keeps sending back when. 
maybe we shouldn't have been because like the first thing it did after leaving earth orbit was to pop out that first CubeSat and take a photograph of itself that <laughs> they could then transmit to the world to say it's real and of course yeah. a lot of this is china proving to the world that they're they're actually yeah. doing what they said they're going to do but right. ian what you said i mean i mean a unprecedented to go for the trifecta on your first attempt to begin with yep and 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 even more jaw-droppingly awesome that they succeeded across the board on all mm -hmm. three of them on their very first attempt so that now makes india the uae and china all succeeding at mars on their very first attempts and yeah. that's yeah. really impressive when you think that you know like you know you can't just say oh it's because the technology has improved because the european space agency lost the scaparelli lander just a few years ago trying yeah. to land on mars no one would say that they're a technological newbie no. at this you know russia has very sadly yet to really succeed at russian at, at, at mars endeavors you know and you know so it's it's not just technological advancement there is still a lot of everything has to go right so you know yep. major congratulations again i know we yeah. said it earlier in the year but yeah Ooh. <laughs> yeah and uh when's the last time we've seen pictures from the little little rover there i don't remember seeing any anytime recently it's um, been a couple that's... months yeah yeah i think so but we haven't heard any news on anything going good or anything going bad so and china is not the most publicly transparent space agency in terms mm -hmm. of what they're doing, what they plan on doing. It's a lot of just like, hey, we are doing this in 10 minutes or hey, yeah. we just did yeah. this three weeks ago. Yeah. Um, so business as usual, it seems. It, it might just be sort of a, you know, we've shown everybody that we did it and now they're just doing science. Yeah. I'm sure we'll hear about any major discoveries. Yep. And, and also- and, and to be fair, you don't see pictures from, from Perseverance and, cur and, and Curiosity and Ingenuity every mm -hmm. single day. Right. You know, when, when they're out there. So, yeah. Right. Yep. Now, you see them more frequently than we're getting them from the land, the Chinese lander. I'm not saying we're, we're not, but. Right. Yeah. Fair is fair. Yes. <laughs> All right. Let's see. Um, any questions regarding Mars? I see uh, Nick asking what the expected lifespan is for Perseverance. Um, so it's a little open-ended. Uh, the primary science mission is set to last a full Martian year to Earth years. So uh, still one year to go on the primary science goal uh, for it. Uh, ingenuity has blown past its, <laughs> I mean, every expectation we've had yeah. for it. So at this point, we're literally just using ingenuity until it won't go anymore. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, but but um, the, the way I, the reason I say it's a little open ended is because it bo both perseverance and curiosity use radioisotopic thermoelectric generators. So they use nuclear power sources, very much like the Voyager spacecraft that are still operating uh, 25 ish and more years after liftoff. Um, so. Um, it's a little open-ended because that will decay and, and the heat that we use to power the systems and keep the vehicles heated and everything will, will eventually reach a point where we can't do that. Um, the benefit is that we don't have to stop during winter months mm -hmm. like we had to do with Spirit and Opportunity because the power source remains constant. Um, but it's a little bit of a give and take. And you can also start doing things with the rovers like, oh, well, if we don't drive them as much anymore, that's more power that we have for science. So you can sort of at a certain point start to do power trades with them. Yeah. But to be fair, we're just starting to get there with curiosity mm -hmm. in doing the power trades with it and, and not in any alarming degree of time. So Percy still has a long way to go before we would even start to think about that. But because it's nuclear and because there are trade-offs, there's not like a, and after 10 years, the solar panels won't be enough anymore because we don't have that with with those particular rovers right um okay any other thoughts on mars before we move on because we, we we do have so much we, we've got to <laughs> cover so much we're going to talk about we still yep. have to go through <laughs> everything else there's lots of rockets and stuff uh that that happened uh space tourism um yeah okay yeah so let's um there's let's actually one on. little point um okay go ahead the next year i guess this year now um we're gonna be seeing the exomars launch uh, from the European Space Agency, the Rosalind Franklin or Rosalind Franklin rover, mm -hmm. um, and that's oh, been right. delayed. That's the one that missed the window this year, or yep, 
last it's, year. Or it's been delayed a few years. times because they found an issue with the parachutes. They were doing some last minute testing of the parachutes to ensure they worked, and they found a major problem with them. So they delayed it to the next launch window, which will be, I believe, around September or October of this year. Mm -hmm. um, and Rosalind Franklin will be a medium-sized rover, um, a scientific mission for the European Space Agency, and it'll be using the ExoMars Orbiter, the Trace Gas Orbiter, which is already at Mars, to do um, orbital uh, photography as well as doing communication back to Earth. Mm -hmm. And that's, yeah, that's a joint uh, prospect between the European Space Agency and Russia, and part of Russia's contribution is the Proton-M rocket. So <laughs> let's hope the gravity sensors are on correctly. Uh, <laughs> okay, uh, <yes. laughs> a little little uh, proton jab there. Um, okay, let's let's talk about uh, some new rockets this year. We had a we had a couple of new orbital orbital rockets. Uh, we had, of course, uh, the Virgin Orbit Launcher One uh, was the f not the first time it launched, but the first time it reached orbit was in 2021, right? <laughs> Yes, and this is actually video from not their first orbital attempt, but the first one that they broadcast to us live mm. um, and everything. So this is actually the tubular bells from there. But yeah, Virgin Orbit made it to orbit <laughs> uh, for the first time in 2021 after um, uh, the first suborbital mission in 2020 had failed uh, back in May, mm -hmm. um, d uh, shortly after first stage ignition. Uh, and this one went much, much better. And then they had their first operational flight with tubular bells part one. Uh, and we also had a, another uh, small satellite rocket company you might say that NASA Spaceflight is quite familiar with, uh, <laughs> Orbit, for the very first time yep. in 2021. Uh, congratulations uh, to Astra. This was video uh, from our joint live stream that we did with them uh, for the launch of the LV-0007 vehicle, which was the first of the Astra missions to successfully reach orbit after uh, one in 2020 successfully reached orbital velocity, but um, the trajectory was not quite right so that its perigee was a bit too low, even though yeah. it achieved the, the proper velocity. But this one achieved the proper velocity and did the simulated deploy of its payload, even though it did not deploy anything uh, on this particular yeah. mission. That was super exciting that that it finally was. happened for him. Yeah. It so was. Cool it yeah. was. And uh, but then we also had uh, two rockets enter the arena on their very first liftoffs as well. Uh, Ian, do you want to talk about? Uh, do you want to uh, talk about Firefly and Nuri here? Yeah, so uh, with Firefly, their Firefly Alpha rocket, um, that's supposed to be a bit on the higher end of the small sat uh, launch market, a little under a ton to orbit per launch. Um, so they did their first attempted launch out of Vandenberg here. We can see a video from Jack Byer from NASA Spaceflight who was on scene there. Um, and they had a successful liftoff, but shortly after liftoff, they actually lost one of the four Reaver engines on the first stage. And because of the way that the engines are sort of hooked up to be controlled and gimbaled, uh, losing one engine during that point of flight is pretty dangerous. And because of which, it did not attain the speeds that it needed. And um, eventually, as it was starting to go supersonic, they lost control of the vehicle and it flipped and broke apart. Um, However, that is not all bad news. They still they still uh, had a successful liftoff, got a lot of flight data there. Um, they got a lot of data out of the engines, and uh, they are currently getting ready to do flight attempt two sometime this year. And that was the one that had the little interesting um, uh, boo boo of when it blew uh, when when it blew. Uh, some of the material landed in people's yards in mm -hmm. Southern California, um, which kind of led to an interesting look by the FAA at um, maybe what their upper level wind limits are in terms of directional speed for some future launches out of a... Uh, out of Vandenberg, because we, we very much, that's what we always try to avoid. Uh, yeah. if, if a vehicle has to be destroyed by range safety is, you know, what's that calculated risk that stuff could come back on to land, and we normally don't allow that, and it happened sort of very abnormally with this mission. Um, but, of course, the launches out of Vandenberg did not cease. The Falcon 9 then went, I mean, the Falcon 9 went days later out of Vandenberg right. and uh, launched twice more out of there afterwards. So launches out of Vandenberg by no means stopped, but it was an interesting little moment of that doesn't happen very often. And, and we did actually stop and look and evaluate the cause of that. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. And then um, we also did see the first launch of Niri, uh, which is a new South Korean rocket. You can see it lifting off here. Um, the launch went pretty well. However, it did not completely succeed. Um, they did lose it during third stage burn, I believe. Um, however, for the first launch of a rocket, getting through the vast majority of the first part of your flight is a lot of great data. Um, the engines on this flight did get some previous flight data during a test a few years ago. Uh, however, um, they did get a lot of good data from this and they are looking to do a second test in the near future. Um, so a good, very, very good attempt at a first flight from Neary almost made it, but uh, unfortunately uh, they did lose it uh, during the mission. So those are the two contenders that didn't quite make it this year, but they did get a lot of flight experience and definitely some priceless data because you can't simulate everything on the ground. Right. Uh, you need to make you need to eventually make flights to get that last bit of experience to get all those forces acting together, uh, and from there you can start to get some serious data and move forward with getting a successful mission. Mm -hmm. Right on. Um, and then we also have uh, this year we had. China put up a new space station. Actually, did they did they put the space station up, or did they just send uh, humans up to it for the first time this year? Both. Okay, yep. that's what I thought. Yeah. Uh, so the first core, uh, the the core module, the Tianhe of the Tiangong space station, uh, was successfully launched, and we did actually see the first crew missions to the station. Um, so this is just the first of three modules that are going to launch the station. The other two will be following in the next two years, possibly. Um, it's not completely clear what that schedule is looking like. Um, we did see some initial spacewalks being performed. Um, and overall, they're outfitting the station, getting it ready, and beginning to do some initial science on board the station, um, which is very exciting to see a new modular large space station coming online. Yeah. Um, because... And because of international um, agreements and uh, sort of, uh, or I guess we could say disagreements, uh, China is not allowed to be a part of the International Space Station project. So uh, they now have their own large space station, their own modular space station, and there's um, talks between them and other countries and other um, space agencies to collaborate on the Tiangong space station. So it'll be interesting to watch that develop, watch new modules launch, new crews launch over the next coming years, and to see Tiangong become fully operational. Right. And there's, uh, they have a crew up there right now, right? So what's, what's our number for people in space? Uh, yes, they do have a crew of three up there right now, and adding that onto the International Space Station's crew of seven, we have ten people on orbit right now. Very cool. Uh, <laughs> we're just yeah. we're getting closer and closer to the future. It's it's so exciting to see, and we've had people tallying as um, uh, we're going to talk on this later as space tourism missions launch. That number will slowly peak up to about like four. I think we had sixteen was the maximum this year. I believe yeah. that's what we got to. There, there was a very brief period where we had seven on the station, uh, seven on the ISS, three on the CSS, and then when Virgin Galactic went yes. with their six, I think that threw it to 16. Yes. Yep. So yep. we're beginning to bring that number higher and higher, and hopefully this year we can break that record again and continue breaking it as the years go on. All right. And then, uh, yeah, well, speaking of uh, sending people to space, uh, how about space tourism? We might, <laughs> uh, might someday get to uh, go ourselves. And here we're looking at footage from Inspiration4. We all want yeah. to talk about that mission. How cool was that? <laughs> uh, well, yeah, the whole I mean, the, the, the lead up and everything was awesome, you know? And the, and the, and the uh, <laughs> support for St. Jude. I'm sorry. I asked y'all to talk and then I just started talking. <laughs> No, yeah. go for it. Go, go, go for it. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, oh, and by the way, thank you to everybody who showed up to the stream and showed their support for St. Jude. I don't think any of us at NASA Space Flight could have ever expected to raise as much money as we did for the kids at St. Jude. Um, yep. So that was pretty incredible. Yeah, nearly 122000 raised by NSF. Unbelievable. Um, and, and our community during that stream was was just absolutely jaw-droppingly in, in, incredible. Yeah. Jaw-droppingly incredible. And the, then the launch itself was, of course, awesome. And, and there's been some some talk after it afterwards, like, did 
they choose this time for this for the jellyfish effect <laughs> so you know i uh, i don't know if we'll ever truly get the answer to that uh, <laughs> yeah but it was perfect wasn't it <laughs> uh but it but it it, it, it was perfect and, and and you know like we we could talk a lot about that but i'll, I'll just i'll just very briefly say because i'm sure there are a lot of questions about this and and some of the other tourism things that that we have um I, you know, this meant a lot to, to different people. It meant, mm -hmm. you know, it meant the most to some because of the fundraising efforts it, it was able to do for childhood cancer research. It meant a lot for others just based on being able to see yourself, you know, finally be able to go to space to see, you know, people who NASA would never allow because of disabilities um, mm -hmm. and quote unquote safety concerns, you know, finally be able to go to see them, you know, take the time to begin to investigate how diet can be used to help control diabetes in space so that maybe you can lift that barrier as well you know there, there were so many things that meant a lot to people that they did and that they chose to do on on, on that flight that set it apart from just a joyride mission mm -hmm. but you know the, the moment that really got me was when cyan and Haley wrapped their arms around each other and and then walked down the crew access arm mm -hmm. together yes yeah. not just going as a crew of professionals right. right but going as friends yeah that got me yeah it was uh, it, it was a lot i just got chills <laughs> yeah the, the whole mission there was just it was well designed they knew exactly what they were doing uh, in terms of the signals they were sending and i i, I think it set a precedent honestly in terms of just what space tourism can be, what space related crowdfunding can be, and just really fundraising in general. There was a lot of good things done here. They did a lot of things right, I think. Yeah. And it's gonna be tough to follow on, I think. Like the next private missions, you have a lot you have big footsteps to follow in. And mm -hmm. it's 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 gonna be it, it, it was a it was a good time, honestly. They to see Dragon's first uh uh sorry. It's completely leaving my mind now. Dragon's first tourism mission um, that was not NASA. NASA was not involved in any way. Um, to see SpaceX really becoming an independent um, operator of crew launch vehicles. Um, and I think it's, we're going to see more commercial crew, or I keep saying commercial crew, more commercial, more space tourism flights. Yeah. Um, private crew flights. Private there you crew go. flights. <laughs> yeah, I'm commercial like, crew is technically right, but that's something different. Yeah. <laughs> right. But yeah. yeah, it's 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 really set a precedent. We're going to be seeing a lot more of space tourism flights over the next few years, and it's I don't know. It, yeah, it, I don't really have many words to say. It's just very exciting. Yeah, yeah. And, and in addition to the tourism flights, one of which we're seeing right now, uh, I mean, very much worth mentioning that we are less than two months away from the next private astronaut flight um, and private science flight with the Axiom One mission, which will take four crew members up to the International Space Station for about a two week mission um, uh, here on a crew dragon as part of the, the, the start of those private astronaut use missions and, yeah. and voyages mm -hmm. to the ISS, but coupled with helping to prepare the ISS and NASA and Axiom for working together because Axiom, if that name sounds familiar, they are the ones who are actively building the new modular additions for the US uh, operating segment of the International Space Station. So, right. you know, there's those, but then we also have the suborbital tourism flights. And this is, these are the ones I'm gonna call tourism for now. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I I don't know, I'm sure we'll very much get to orbital, flat out orbital tourism at one point. I, I personally can't call inspiration for a, a, a pure tourism flight. Um, right, yeah, I meant more. Part of what yeah. They did. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the, we had Blue Origin, um, which developed also a nice little cadence this year too, which which yeah. I think was perhaps the biggest of the two suborbital stories, not just that the two major suborbital companies did it um, and, and, and did their first crewed passenger carrying crewed flights um, this right. year. Virgin Galactic had obviously done crewed flights before, but with pilots. Um, Mm. And, and, and things like that, or Beth went up it is worth as noting, the yeah. test. But but this was the first like how they seek to operate, you know, right. flight in that regard. So, mm -hmm. you know, the fact that they both did that was very interesting. We also got some very scary safety reports from both of them. Uh, one mm. that seems to have grounded Virgin Galactic until changes can be made, and one that 
more or less just appeared to have been ignored and yeah. uh, by Blue Origin because the FAA wouldn't stop them. So move on and ignore the the safety issues that were sort of brought to light there. Uh, that's what it appears, Blue because Blue Origin will not say anything um, yep. about it. Um, so all we have is the very open letter about the culture of safety from Blue Origin. Um, so that's all we've got. Uh, and of course, uh, Virgin Galactic experienced issues on this flight that we're watching right now, which appeared to go very smoothly, but then we realized after the fact that no, so some safety guidelines, some very important ones were violated on the flight. A blinking red light was ignored or something? A, a very important blinking red emergency light that you could not attain the proper glide trajectory back to the runway mm -hmm. uh, was ignored, and they basically just decided that they could force it into it on the glide back, which they did. But what's the point of the warning light if you're going to ignore it? Right. Um, you know, so there, there's sort of that. And there was also some structural issues with the vehicle, too, that are being addressed um, before it flies again. So, um, but everyone, everyone, was, everyone succeeded. That, that mission was a great success happening just a, a week or so before the Blue Origin flight. So, yeah. And yep. then Blue really developed that nice cadence after the, the flight with um, uh, Wally Funk on, on their very first one. They followed that up with another four-person crew uh, that included William Shatner, um, which mm -hmm. I think all of us, that was, that was the good PR day for Blue Origin when William yeah. Shatner just began speaking. And yes. it yeah. was very much like everyone just needs yes. to shut up and listen to this man Yeah, that, yeah. because this is coming <laughs> from his heart because anyone who has seen him act knows he has one acting style and that's not it. <laughs> um, you know, he so was like, changed, man. And, Fair enough. Yeah, yeah. That, yeah that, he was. that was incredible. Um, yep. Uh, that was incredible. And then they followed it up in December with their third. So they, they are establishing a very nice cadence at Blue Origin. Yeah. With their yeah, impressive. The very impressive. Yeah, they said that they wanted to do a couple more flights uh, before the end of the year, and they surely did. Yeah. Um, <laughs> let's see. We've got uh, – there was also a couple of uh, Soyuz uh, tourism missions. Well, one wasn't – I don't know if you'd call it tourism because it was uh, – they were making a movie. Uh, yeah, Ian, I'm curious on your thoughts on this. I definitely give the tourism award, the orbital tourism award to the uh, to the Mizawa uh, flight. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I would more just classify the, the, the movie one as that. There, there's your for profit commercial venture. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Ross Cosmos just happened to beat us to it, and before anyone says anything, oh, we shouldn't be filming movies in space. You better be saying the same thing when SpaceX launches Tom Cruise because that's mm -hmm. been announced. Uh, yeah. You know. <laughs> I've not heard any any gripes about the. We'll filming. get to well, well okay. yeah we'll get to that. I heard a few okay. gripes with, with when Russia announced it, but oh. I also very quickly was like, and this is fine. Yeah. Uh, but but anyway, <laughs> yes. Um, I don't know. I I'd give that to just pure hey. If you can make a profit and film a movie in space, go for it. Yeah, yeah. if you can do it safely, then yeah. Yeah, no they're, they're flying up for a business purpose to the space station. There was no major disruption to the station activities, and they went about their day. And I don't see a problem with that, honestly. Um, yeah, I, I, I just think that's just, it's just a neat thing that we're starting to see that, and that it's just, oh, normal. They just launched people to the space station to record a movie, and they went back after a few days. Cool. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um. So let's, uh, I just looked at the clock and it is, we are already an hour in. So we, we still have <laughs> predictions coming up for this year. So let's, let's try to burn through some Starship testing uh, that happened this year. It was a big year for Starship and, and Starbase in general. And a lot of growth down there. Look, I mean, just look how nothing there is <laughs> in this right here. You're looking at uh, SN10 here. And, yeah, uh, maybe, oh, maybe we could maybe yeah. we could use this section to take a take some questions because yeah. yeah, I mean it was you know like SN8 flew at the end of last year and then nine and then ten which blew up <laughs> um, <laughs> in the fog that that was the fog one where you didn't see anything um, right and then you had eleven uh, and then you had eleven which blew as well didn't didn't quite make it um, and then you had fifteen which succeeded um, and yep. stuck. And stuck the landing. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yep. Um, but I'm sure there there are a lot of uh, of questions that maybe we we could we could hit on 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 the little time on on the time we have here. There there are some. Let's see. One one had. Oh, to and do... I'm sorry, I misspoke. Eleven was the one in the fog. Um, right. uh, Ten was the one on the pad that we yes. 
Yep. Uh, one question, just the first one I saw, uh, what differences will Raptor 2 have from 1? Uh, so according to Elon quite a bit, it's being simplified a lot with the design for rapid reusability in mind and a lot of the lessons that they learned from Raptor, from Raptor 1 production. Uh, basically, the last update that we got from him was that if you look at Raptor 1, it's going to look like Raptor 1 is a mess compared to Raptor 2. Uh, when you see all of its plumbing. So uh, according to him, very simplified in that regard. Uh, and Soham Borad said, how can you forget about HLS? And you're right, we did not mention HLS. That was that was definitely a thing that happened this year. Well, because I figured we'd get story. a question on it. Yeah. <laughs> Ian, <laughs> want to take it away? <laughs> Yes, yeah, so HLS was um, a very smooth sailing, very easy selection. No, not at all. <laughs> um, <laughs> HLS was a thing that happened, uh, and what HLS is, it's the landing program for or the landing system, human landing system for the Artemis program. Um, and there were three main contenders there that became finalists. Um, there was SpaceX with Starship. Um, there was Blue Origin with their national team. That was a more traditional style lunar lander. And then Dynetics with their lander, which was a very interesting one with drop tanks and uh, vertical solar panels. It was an interesting was design. Cool. Yeah, it, it was, was very cool. Um, but ultimately, because of funding restrictions and because of um, program-related um, uh, observations and what NASA had decided would be the most uh, reliable, would be the cheapest, would be the most real to come to reality, um, they went with SpaceX's Starship as the sole, um, the sole contractor for the human landing system. This for the first brought... one, right? It's just that's just for yes, the first one. The there first will still one... be others selected later, possibly. Yes, this is just for Artemis three or Artemis four or whatever's going on. Mm -hmm. um, and then afterwards, they will reopen the competition. Um, obviously, SpaceX will likely have a more mature system, but Blue Origin, Dynetics, other companies can toss in their new contributors uh, or their new uh, competitors. Uh, but NASA did choose just Starship for Artemis three. This brought about a lot someone of... Someone wasn't happy. <laughs> someone wasn't happy. And Blue Origin performed a lot of lawsuits. They stopped the competition. They had to stop all NASA involvement on the Starship program for several months. Um, NASA was not allowed to really look into, really listen into what was going on down at Boca Chica, at SpaceX, with Starship in general. And... Uh, no doubt it has delayed the HLS program. Um, in the end, the lawsuits were dropped and NASA is now allowed to continue ahead with Starship. And it seems that their next uh, sort of observation in the program will be the orbital test flight of Starship, which we're gonna get into. Right, and, and, and actually, and, go ahead, and, sorry, Chris. And, and I think one quick thing, because I know Michael has a thing that we really want to do here uh, as well, but we've got a couple more questions I'm thinking about Starship. A uh, very important uh, a caveat to what you said there, um, the, 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 the federal judges ruled against Blue Origin in the lawsuit. It wasn't that the lawsuit was dropped, it's that yes. the, the, the courts outright yes. rejected it um, yes. and, and everything and, and basically said you have, you have no leg to stand on here. Uh, and, and worth it in fairness's point to, to point out that the Government Accountability Office protest from both Blue Origin and Dynetics very worthwhile, uh, a, a logical step that companies have when these awards don't quite go the way they want. More so the lawsuit after that, um, yeah. after the GAO said you don't have a leg to stand on here. It was more the lawsuit after that that ground it to a halt for another five months that everyone just sort of threw their hands in the air and went, oh, come on, you lost. Like, Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And yeah, yeah. It's, it's perfectly normal. And like, there's really nothing wrong with being like, okay, we want a second check here just like to make sure everything was success. Like, um, unbiased and make sure everything that was everything was looked over properly totally understandable but then like moving on to lawsuits and sort of being like well hang on a second is yeah and especially yeah. since it, NASA was very clear it's just for the first landing yeah. it's just mm -hmm. for the first one whether that ends up being Artemis 3 Artemis 4 or called something else who who knows what it'll ultimately be mm -hmm. but it's, especially since NASA just said hey it's just for this one after that we still want a second one we just can't afford to have two and then down select to one. We're just going right. to down select to one now, which they could totally do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Um, okay. So I think just because we are, I mean, we're already <laughs> crunched for time. So uh, we promise ooh. this next part is really interactive, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, well, yeah. So no, what, I... <laughs> what, what, what we've, what we've done, well, what Michael has done, he has a series of questions and he, he told me yesterday, we all must answer. There's no like, 
bowing out and like, oh, I don't know. And um, so he's he's going to flash up some some questions or scenarios or whatever on the screen. And we each have to make our predictions and, you know, have a, have some discussion perhaps about it. So uh, Michael, Michael Baylor is behind the scenes and he will flash something up on the screen here shortly, I'm guessing. And he said fun. he would not tell us what they were. He did tweet something uh, yesterday, sort of asking people what they <laughs> thought, like what missions would, would go. All right, here we go. Ooh. Will a yeah. starship reach orbital velocity in 2022? If so, which month? Ooh. Month. Oh, man. Uh, I would say yes. He's I'll, tricky I'll also here. say yes. Yeah. yeah. I will say yes. Yes. Um, month. Yeah, what month? I, August. I th- July. I was I was already thinking June, so I'll I'll go with the earliest. I'll I'll be the earliest one, and uh, mm-hmm. so so June for me, July for Ian, and August for so, Chris. So, so hey, I think, that, a, I think a very firm summer from summertime. All of us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Cool. <laughs> uh, man, and you know, you know, there's going to be an end of year show now where we're going to be shown this again. Oh, I know. <laughs> we're going to be yeah. shamed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I love this though. I, I I like the idea that a year from now we're gonna have to face our predictions. I love it. I like it. Yeah. <laughs> and this is now. I, I do want to clarify this. Uh, will Will Starship reach orbital? Oh, and then Michael just underlined it right as I was thinking about it. Orbital mm-hmm. vo- actual orbital velocity or the like the first mission, like where it doesn't actually and it's set to come back down uh, on it on its first uh, orbit around. Which isn't actually in orbit. Is so this a new, what we're, is this a we're new question, or did I misread no, the first no, one? I, I'm, oh, just, okay. I'm just trying to clarify <laughs> that we we are talking about actual orbital velocity, not okay, not yeah. like the first one. Oh, he's saying this oh, is this a new is question. A new, oh, it is well, a new question. What was the first one? This is my answer to orbital velocity. Okay. <laughs> well, no, no. Okay. I, no, th- yeah, I have a different answer for this one. I still oh, say shoot. I yes, misread the but first it's, one. But it's going to be. It's oh, first be... orbital launch. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, I would have had a okay. slightly different answer. Uh, Misunderstood. Uh, also, yes, August for yes. <laughs> July. Yep. Um, I think it'll be later. I, I I think after the after the first orbital launch, I think it. it I'll go with uh, I'll go with August actually. So I'll say I'll I'll go with Chris with the August, and obviously that's a yes. I, I think for yeah, I'll, I'll clarify my previous one. Even though the what I said will stand first or like first orbital attempt, I, I think would be earlier than this. I'm I'm going with it reaches orbital velocity on the second orbital attempt. Okay. Yeah, I'm with you, Chris. I think it would be yeah. I, I, if I had to guess for a first launch attempt, May. Yeah, that's my thoughts. So so sorry, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> There's an asterisk next Ooh. to his answer. Mm. Oh, will Vulcan launch in 2022? No. The, the the answer to this could affect the answer to another possible uh, question that might ooh. be coming. My gut says no. <laughs> oh man. I would love nothing more than to see Vulcan, especially Vulcan launch a dream chaser this year, but that I, I can't see that definitely it. won't happen. Absolutely. Um, not. <laughs> Let's see. Can I can I can I ask a side question? How many atlases are left? Like what, what? Oh, they can't switch. They can't. Yeah. They, they they can't switch what's on it too. Um, yeah, they've, they have they yeah. have they have an end date now for Atlas. Yeah. I think there's like what twenty thirty left. Something like okay, that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So it's quite a few. I mean, either way, it's not like it's. It's not like there's something ULA can do. It's all sort of in <laughs> Blue Origin's hands. Um, I'm just gonna go against the grain and say yes because I really want to see uh, Vulcan launch. Okay. Whew. All right. Up next, will Artemis one yes. launch in 2022? Yes. yes. I say yes. Yep. Yes. It might be I... summertime or so, but yes. Early summer, maybe in May at the earliest. But... In the calendar year, yes. Yeah, definitely, <laughs> definitely. Oh. Will, will Orbital Flight Test 2 launch in 2022? We're talking about Starliner here, y'all. Um, if you remember, uh, in I'll... December of 2019. Yeah. Or 20, <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, 20. December 2019. Is, Was it 19? It, yeah, it, it has been two, over two years uh, oh, that man. we've been fixing this. Yes, because yes. I just think at some point they'll find an Atlas mission to shove off the manifest to give it a slot. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I, that, I agree. Yeah, but, but that, that's, that's why I say yes to that, mm-hmm. even though I know we're not caveating it here. 
I think Boeing will flash. I think Boeing will flash their International Space Station. This is a NASA mission card and bump some commercial mission to some further launch window. Well, Ariane Six launch in twenty twenty two. I don't have nearly as much insight into Man. this as y'all probably do. Um, it's mm-hmm. definitely got a shot, but it's definitely got a long way to go. Uh, as much as I would love to say yes, I'm going to say a begrudging it'll miss it by... I'm going to say a begrudging no, my caveat being that it will miss it by like a couple of months. But I know Agreed. we're not caveating okay. it for the, for the yep. snapshot, but my right. answer would be no. Yeah, yeah they have a, I, I agree. No, just because the, a... the, the, the yeah, the Pathfinder still has. To, sorry, I was there, Stephen. Sorry, 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 Ian. Like I was <laughs> no, <ahead>. sorry. Um, <laughs> You're good. Uh, mainly because the 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 Pathfinder still has to get there. They have to do all the fueling tests at the pad. They have to static fire this thing at the pad, and the Pathfinder is then not the one that does the first flight. So uh, there's a lot to it that would just lead me to go. My normal gut will just say they'll miss it by a couple months. All right. Yeah. Well, then I will go with y'all. <laughs> no. <laughs> see what's next here this is fun so far i like yeah i love this stuff well terran one reach orbit in 2022 no no i'm gonna go against orbit no i'm gonna go against i'm gonna go against your grain and say yes only because they have several missions already booked for 2022. Now, again, that is absolutely not an indicator that they're going to launch several missions in 2022, mm-hmm. but it seems like they're confident they have the capability, or at least the possibility of the capability of launching several times. And I, 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 I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt. On the first mission, no. Second mission, maybe not. But I think at some time, at some point this year, I could see them reaching orbit. Yeah, I was gonna kind of say something along those lines. It, it, if they've got enough time to reach like their third or fourth attempt, that seems to be sort of the magic number with mm. uh, with you know first first uh, orbital attempts. So if they got the time, then I'll I'll go ahead and say yes. Yep. All right, well, Rocket Lab, Ooh. catch a booster in 2022. I have no, I think they're going to do Ooh. it their first try. Honestly, I, I think first time they try to catch one, I think they're going to do it. Now, I don't know what kind which of shape not, it's going to be. Which in. isn't necessarily the question that's being no, asked. I know, yeah. I know. I, I was, I'm saying my answer is yes, but I want to, I'll okay. take it a step further and say that I think that they will do it on their first attempt. I, I, I think they've got it down. I, I think it's you. a lot easier than landing. Uh, yeah, landing I, on its, you know, go ahead. I go, I go, yes. Um, uh, yeah, I, I'm gonna, now, it may it not be that. reusable, they, you know, <laughs> they, may, they may not be able to put it back on the launch pad, but I do think that they'll grab it the first time. Mm-hmm. I think they will because they've said in the past and they've held firm that their next attempt at any sort of recovery will be a catch attempt. Mm-hmm. Um, and they have a lot of missions ready for 2022, and I think within that they can slot recoveries into there yeah so I, I i think so and, yeah. and the only reason i'm not willing to say yes on the first attempt is just the helicopter pilot the safety culture might err a lot more on the side of caution the first time you try to approach mm-hmm. something like that in a helicopter to, to grab it so yeah maybe not the first time they attempt it but but definitely they'll get it because i'm i'm with you yeah yeah, yeah. not not as also... difficult as <laughs> not as difficult as landing it, but that's not to say it's not difficult. Right. right. <laughs> I think also another thing they have on their side is they could, they said they can do several attempts per booster. So it's not coming like so fast down. They have one attempt and that's it. Sure. If they miss it or if they're like, okay, we don't like this angle, they can go around and do several attempts before it hits the ocean. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I think with yeah. that on our side, I think that they'll get it at some point this year. Right. There may be some confirmational bias, but I, I, the video that I saw of them doing the test catches, I was like, this yeah. looks like something they can do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, here we go. Will Rocket Lab refly a booster in 2022? Now, this is a slightly more difficult question. I go no on that one. I agree. I'd yeah. say no. Parts of boosters, yes maybe even parts of engines or engines themselves, but I can't see a whole booster. I think they would definitely want to tear apart that first booster they get back. Mm-hmm. 
or do at least extreme inspections on it because it hasn't touched salt water. So you're getting a boost to pristine from atmospheric entry. Right. I, oh man, I'm just, I'm just going to go against the grain and be the optimist on this one and say yes. <laughs> <laughs> now, 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 to be fair, a lot of that probably has to do with the cadence that they end up hitting. And, and, and it is worth noting that, you know, like Rocket Lab has suffered, like Rocket Lab did suffer a failure that they, that they recovered from very quickly, you know, in, you know, here, but they, they, they have not attained the flight rate that they've been talking about yet. True. And, and I think reflying a booster will largely come down to the flight rate that they've got or a customer like the Space Force doing what they've done with some other companies, right? And across the board companies, right? Where we've seen them go like, prove to us you could do something very quickly if we needed mm -hmm. you to. Right, and maybe they would go and reuse a booster on that, but I think it's going to ultimately come down to their flight rate in 2022. And yeah. to be fair, I'm kind of waiting for that flight rate to get up there. Yeah. Um, Agreed. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because... Uh, go ahead. I was about to say, real quick before you touch this question, their main point of reusability is to get that flight rate continuously high. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, and like, uh, well, sort of with SpaceX, you know, the... When they, the more boosters they get back, the more they can learn about them, the more reliable they can be. And I think it'll eventually lead to faster turnaround. Yep. Yeah. Uh, okay. Will Firefly Alpha reach orbit in 2022? Yeah. 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 Yep. Yeah, I, I think so too. They got um, pretty far on their first mission. Mm -hmm. And if they just didn't have that engine out, I think they would have gotten a lot farther as well. Yeah. Um, they didn't get to second stage burn, which I think at this point is probably the biggest question mark. Um, because we saw it, like, it might with... take them a, a, a couple tries in 2022 yeah. to get there, but but I'm with you, Ian. Yeah, for the exact reason the logic you're using. They're getting yeah. ready for a mission in February, but there have been recent news about what's going on at the company, and that's really putting it up in the air. But I think sometime earlier this year we can see a next attempt, and I think this year they can get to orbit. Yeah. yeah, I guess all of this assumes that all of these companies aren't bankrupt by the right. end of the year. <laughs> uh, but, but anyway. Yeah. Anyway. Space is yeah. not only hard, but it's also expensive. And competitive now with all the small sat launchers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of. Um, <laughs> ABL. Will ABL reach orbit in 2022? This is the company I know the absolute least about. So I'm going to probably go off of y'all's uh, y'all's insight. Same here. Um, no I do know a bit about that. Them. We're hesitant on the others. Um, no attempt yet to no attempt yet, mm -hmm. right, to reach orbit. So this would include the first launch attempt. Um, you know, in, 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 and you know, when you go back through history, I think we figured this out. If you go back through history, it's only three rockets that didn't carry a lot of lineage forward reached orbit on their very first attempt throughout history. Um, yeah. That is a tall bar to cross, um, even with today's technology. Uh, I go no. I just I, don't I would think agree. they have yeah. enough time for first attempt, gauge what goes wrong, and 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 do a second. You know. Right. Where are they launching from? Um. Kodiak. Yeah, Kodiak, Kodiak, I believe, Kodiak. is their first one, yeah. Honestly, so, yeah, like you said, there's no, this is a brand new thing. I would say no. Also, because their schedule's kind of up in the air, they've been pretty quiet. Now, maybe they're coming from an astro point of view, where they're suddenly, all of a sudden going to say, here's our launch pad that's set up, it launches tomorrow at noon. But I, 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 I would say no, because we haven't seen an attempt from them, we haven't heard much from them about what's going on. And we haven't really seen hardware, I don't believe. So I'm going to go up and say no. And, and, and just in case people don't really know who Abel is, um, they're, they're a space company based out, of, um, based out of Texas, developing a new launcher system. Um, and um, they, 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 they've, they've done testing throughout the US and Georgia and Spaceport New Mexico. Um, so uh, yeah, their, their first one is planned right now um, for, uh, it's the flight of the RS-1 rocket is planned for Kodiak Island, but they've also got um, some flights planned out of uh, the Shetland Space Center in the United Kingdom, as well as Cumberland Island near St. Mary's, Georgia as well coming up. Um, but b b basically it's an RP-1 kerosene and liquid oxygen rocket is, is what we're talking about here for reference, uh, capable of bringing about 13, uh, one, one, 1,300 kilograms to a low Earth orbit. 
Oh, sorry, Southern California. I misspoke. Southern California Company. Sorry. Yes. Neat. All right. And then we've got, will Ingenuity, Ingenuity still be flying in December of 2022? Ooh. Okay, I that's sure hope so. Me too. It is, it is tricky. I mean, eventually these little... These little rotors are going to start wearing out at some point. There's a lot of dust on Mars, you know. I'll and... just say yes. I, I'm just going to say yes. Yeah, I'm about to say yeah. I, Optimism. I, I'm being very optimistic, but like, still, it seems to be going well. They seem to really like it. It's not going to have a high flight rate, like about like one, maybe two flights per month. Mm -hmm. But still, if if there's a need for science, and it seems like the rover team really likes it, it seems to be really helpful. I think they're going to fly it. If something goes wrong, they're going to just engineer the crap out of it to keep it yeah. flying. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to go with y'all uh, just out of sheer optimism. I, I really want little ingenuity to keep on flying and scouting ahead. They've I, think it's, I think it's really cool. They've go. discovered something they didn't expect. When the rotor blades turn on, it clears the dust off the solar panels. <laughs> it's like, oh, yeah. <laughs> why, didn't, why didn't we think about that? <laughs> so that will help, but obviously not yeah. impervious to solar cell degradation. Obviously, if there's a dust storm, God forbid. Oh, um, man. You know, like, like things like that, but I'm going with yes. Yeah. I wonder if they have some, some kind of a plan for, like, if it gets blown over on its side or... It's done. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's done. It can't write itself. Yeah. Okay. I mean, the well, winds on Mars aren't that powerful, though. If it, yeah. it's pro it'd probably be okay. But it light. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Ooh. Ooh. Will SpaceX reach 15 flights of a? We were talking Falcon, of a, Falcon of, Nine of a booster. Of so a, one, well... <laughs> was, one just did 11. Yes. No. No. I don't think so. I think no because we've had very slow progress this year in terms of getting booster flights up there. I think we ended last year with about like flight eight or nine or so, and they have a lot more boosters coming online. Like they have 1067, 1069, uh, 71, so on are going to be coming in. Probably want to use those because they're newer. Uh, they've had little small upgrades on them. Like we've seen, they don't like flying 1049 as much because the forties are a lot older generation than the seventies. Mm. Um, and I think they're getting more and more reluctant to fly them as time goes on and refurbishments going on. But I think there's still a lot of other younger boosters too. It's only like three or five or even eight flights that will probably rack up those flights before they get to even flight 13 or 14. So I think 15 is probably a no for a this year. Out of, a little out of reach. Well, I... Do you want I, do you want my answer like my explanation, Stephen, before you break the tie? <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Starlink. Yeah, fair. I was thinking that's the only caveat if they're just like, all right, screw it. Let's see how far this thing can go. Right. And then I think we can definitely see 15 and if we flights. Don't, and if we don't get the second half year lull like we got this year and they just keep slamming them out for the mm -hmm. for the other mm -hmm. shells, I think that's how you get to 15. Other than that, I totally agree with you. I would expect to see the younger boosters reserved for like the NASA needs a booster for a th and it's so grab the thrice flown one. You know, yeah. instead of the twelfth flown one. Yeah, you yeah. you you almost had me changing my mind to go with no, but um, I'm saying yes because I think that while they are kind of slow to to take that next launch, you know, that tenth and eleventh and whatever, I think it's the same thing as when they were first starting to reuse them. They're learning, you know, they're inspecting, they're making sure they're still safe, and then as they cross these hurdles, then they'll they'll take those ninth, tenth, eleventh flights quicker you know so the life leaders are going to slowly lead the way but then the other boosters are going to sort of follow suit I, I guess that that's my guess yeah and i actually just saw a question in chat i don't know if i'm allowed to do this but um alex one of the uh, members of that space my members said which booster do we think Ooh, well wow, that's a that's, that's a toughie i i would probably say 1051 if i had to guess 1051 because that's the current life leader it seems to be newer generation mm -hmm. that's my guess unless they take one of the newer ones and just slam it launch after launch yeah i i don't know but it, it'd be it'd be hard to say i would have to look at the uh the list of all the active boosters and i mean 51 seems like a good candidate because it's in the lead right now but mm -hmm. like you know like we were saying like it, <laughs> well i don't know See, what were you going to say, Chris? This this isn't one of Michael's questions, so I plead the fifth. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, good point. I don't have to answer this. <laughs> Whoa, okay. Kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> don't shoot the messenger. Anyway. Yeah, right. Um, Ooh, I don't boy. know. I'll say I'll, I'll say fifty-one. Sure. Yeah. 
Um, okay, in this one here, uh, how many times will Falcon launch in 2022? So we've got mm. 31 in 2021, right? It was 31 Falcon launches. Yeah. We've got a lot. We've got uh, probably a lot of Starlink. We've got... Um, 42. Up, four, I was four. Say 45. <laughs> Oh, that's 42. what I was gonna say. So then I went down to forty-two. I'll go forty-two. Um, I'm gonna say, I'll say thirty, thirty-six. Okay. Yeah. Add yeah. Uh, take take what we had this year. Add a, a few more. You know, we've got possibly up to five Falcon heavies, but you know. Maybe. Which count because we're we're taking Falcon yep. nines and oh, Falcon true. heavies. Yeah, um, yeah. So I think they'll raise the raise the bar a little bit. Um, I don't know about the forties, but we'll see. Yeah. And how many total launches will oh, reach no. orbit? Ooh, will oh, will do we, we get to orbit? That... Do we get to how many how many reached orbit in twenty twenty one? Oh, hang yeah. on. Yes, 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 yes. I can, I can. That's something can that help. I don't know. It was just over 100. Um, wow. Okay. Uh, 2021 in space flight. Hang on. Well, those humans, well, they'd be launching things, I'll tell you. <laughs> yeah. How many did we do? Uh, there were, okay, there were 146 total launches of which 135 reached orbit. So 135 right. reached orbit in 2021. I'll go with 100. 53 will reach orbit. One dollar, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, um, well, I hate uh, to break it to you, but you're going to lose in week one, Stephen. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I'll, I'll go uh, It's kind of in the same ballpark. Uh, one. Yeah, I'll just go an even 150. I'm going to say 160. I think with the rise of the small sat launch industry, there's definitely gonna be a lot more. Mm -hmm. um, Y'all are I think... cowards for not picking a specific number. <laughs> yeah, yeah, probably. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's fun so, in that. There's... Exactly. <laughs> that way, that that way, I can legitimately say missed it by one. You know. <laughs> <laughs> hey, one fifty one. I will still have missed it by one. Ah, and, and I'll mm -hmm. go. No, no, you hedged. You hedged. No, it is sorry. <laughs> Oh. Okay, what will be the next lander to land on the moon? Ooh, um, so, dang. so we've got. Is it what is it? Capstone is coming up. Is that Capstone oh. is a orbiter mission to okay. test out a new lunar orbit? Um, is it specifically to land. All right, to Sean land Trayon three is coming up as well. Peregrine. Peregrine is, is on its way. What's the one Vulcan? What's the one Rocket Labs launching? Is that Capstone? That's yeah, Capstone. It's it, just an it, orbiter, it, though. Um, Falcon has something going to the moon. I think mm. coming up, right? Oh, yeah. Boy. Hang on. Um, um, Michael really put us on the spot with the last he one. He really? Oh, wow. This is <laughs> yeah. Really that's good. that's um, tricky. Okay. So, uh, no, okay yeah. I'm getting help in the background. Nova C yeah. is on is on SpaceX uh, for the first half of the year. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Luna 25 from Mars Cosmos is also scheduled yes. for July of 2022. Intuitive Machines is scheduled for the first quarter. That's Nova C. Uh, Electron Capstone is scheduled for Mar March 29th, but that's an orbiter and not a lander. I'm going to say probably Nova C then in that case. It is definitely being a bit optimistic because it's their first lander, but it's just such a mess of things. <laughs> oh, it's, a, it's such a mess of new landers, like even Peregrine. Is a new really it's really a new type which, of which honestly is so far down the list at the yeah. end of the year is, is is not a contender at all i mean literally 12 other missions would have to not launch for peregrine to get there first um, yeah i'll go i'll go with ian nova c okay i'll go um... with, i'll go with capstone oh, that, that, that's not gonna land Oh, it's not going to land. So, <laughs> damn it. Yeah. So, Novacy. Yeah. Yeah. I <laughs> think so. Like, 
Yeah. It's so tricky, but it was selected for clips. So NASA is working with them. Mm. So I think having NASA's expertise on your side definitely increases your chances here. Well, now it doesn't specify what type of landing it is. You know, hitting the surface is still landing. <laughs> <laughs> a hard, a fast landing. <laughs> and um, that was, uh, that was our last one. Uh, it, there are some super chats that have come in uh, and, Oh my goodness. Uh, Dank Jeb. Wow. Saying happy new year. I uh, just want to thank the entire uh, NASA space flight team. Uh, wait, I just lost my spot uh, for keeping the immensely complex and high risk news site forum and YouTube channel going. Uh, I can't wait to see how this year goes for this awesome team this year uh, in space flight is shaping up to be amazing. Thank you so much. Thank wow. you. That is super. Wow. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. Yeah. Super um, generous of you. Wow. Um, and wow. <laughs> I don't, yeah, I don't know what to say. Um, <laughs> and thank you for everybody else for your support. And, you know, I know we're already into the new year, but thanks for all, all the support, uh, over the past year. Uh, it would not, none of the stuff that we do would be possible without you guys. Um, and I, maybe this will take us over a couple of minutes, but outdoors, man, uh, put this in the chat, uh, quite a while back, uh, just real quick, what was your favorite moment of the year and what will be your favorite moment for this year? Huh. Watch, uh, be, 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 being being one of the very few people who, who got to help bring the James Webb launch to the world. Yep. That, that's what did it for me in, in 2021. Not to belittle everything else, but that's what it did for me in 2021. Uh, 2022, what am I most looking forward to? Uh, I'm going to... I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go against everyone's expectations. Uh, the Psyche mission launch in the middle oh, of the year okay. is the one I'm really looking forward to this year. I'm going to keep it to the science element of that. Fair. All right. All right. Okay. Um, huh. Ian? I, I'm, I'm going to go with pretty much 90% of people here and say the Starship testing specifically like SN10 and SN15, just seeing like the progress being made with that, doing like a, such a revolutionary maneuver and it being even just a small step towards getting us back to the moon and Mars and also being able to be a part of those launch broadcasts. I believe I was part of 10 and 15, those launch broadcasts. And even just being one of those few people, that was just awesome just to be, like Chris said, and I know it was like a lot smaller than literally going to French Guiana. But, like for <laughs> me, that's just like a nice little thing to like be a part of and just help share my thoughts and I don't know, bring that. But for 2022, I would say that's a lot trickier question to answer because there's a lot of awesome stuff happening next year. Mm -hmm. I think the Starship orbital progress, not any single flight will be very fun to watch unfold. Mm -hmm. I also think the James Webb Space Telescope progress will be interesting to watch literally unfold. Yeah. Um, nice. <laughs> I, sh I should time myself out for that. That was ridiculous. Um, <laughs> I just want to take a moment to say that, that you know, Hagen uh, Warren had the, the space flight quote of the year on his yes. first ever outing uh, on, on a stream of any kind when the solar panel on Webb popped out and he went, one down, 343 to go. Yeah. <laughs> Um, uh, yeah, that, that was hilarious. Um, I can be real quick. Uh, my favorite thing, I already said it, it was the Perseverance landing. I just love that stuff. Um, and then what I'm looking forward to most is going to be Artemis 1 because I never got to see a space shuttle launch, and I have heard that they are incredible and the power is amazing. So with that, we bid adieu to 2021, <laughs> and uh, hello to 2022, and uh, Thank you so much again for all of your support, especially our members for that ongoing support. Uh, it really helps us uh, keep everything running and, uh, you know, cameras and robots and, and bandwidth and all that kind of stuff, you know, it costs money. And so the fact that you would throw us a few bucks each month is, uh, is, is huge. Thank you so much to everybody. And thank you all for watching and listening and coming along for the ride. Uh, you know, don't forget about Starbase Live. It's always there when you're ready to check in. And then Fleet Cam is also here uh, in Port Canaveral. And with that, uh, we'll see y'all next time. Have a good week. Have a good year. <laughs> Zero. First motion. First motion.
Mary is doing an absolutely Oh perfect. my gosh. And the flip looks like they lost a piece oh. there. Oh. 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 That was the final no. landing engine. Single oh. engine. Was that intentional? Oh, oh my god, it should land on one engine. Oh. Landing oh, leg deployed. Oh, 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 you can do it, you can do it. Is it gonna stay? Oh, is it red? <laughs> it did it! No. It did it! Yes. Whoa, whoa, whoa! Whoa! Oh my god. There you go. There's your methane leak. Did it. Our camera. It hit the ground. Okay. Our camera. <laughs> Flying debris and pieces of starship. There's stuff smoking on the ground in front of the camera. Please come on. Oh, it's do so it. smooth. Do it. Do it. Oh, it. Oh, oh. come on. Right here. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> I landed on the hopper. That is incredible. Great work, Jack. Drop. There, there, goes, goes. there it goes. There it goes. There it goes. That has to it's be Phobos. Yep, that, 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 that definitely that's says Phobos. Wow. <laughs> that's it, Brady. Good job, dude. <laughs> nice. Welcome to the Guiana Space Center, where we are live on location for this incredible and historic mission. In second engine cutoff, and Astra's LV-0007 has successfully reached orbit. There is a new orbital rocket. Starship prototype Ship 20 has been mated with Super Heavy Booster 4. We have Merlin engine ignition and liftoff of the Falcon 9 with inspiration for Go Everyone! Um, I, I'm deeply, deeply inspired to what you all have done today by what SpaceX has done. Uh, and this whole program as a, as a whole, space is kind of amazing.